Good morning, Calvary. The older I get, the sweeter it is to gather with brothers and sisters and worship our God. Let's begin this morning hearing directly from him. Would you rise out of respect of reading for the word as we look to Galatians chapter five and verse one. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. God knew that we would need the reminder that the same mercy and grace freely given to us that brought us into relationship with him is the same mercy and grace that would sustain that relationship and grow that relationship. And how we do that, how we stand firm and not take that yoke of slavery back upon us is completely counterintuitive. It is to relinquish control of our lives and let Jesus lead as we live according to his word and by the leading of his Holy Spirit. So let's lay our burdens at the foot of the cross together this morning and worship our God as king, not only of the universe, but of our lives. Let's worship. Of his people on their knees Awake up, you 
his praise aloud. Sing his praise aloud.
haughty for a second. Let go of the tension. Embrace God's presence. He is here. He is here. He is here for you. He is here to be glorified by your worship. He loves your praise. He loves to hear you sing and shout words of, of worship to Him to reflect His nature. I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. You may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. You may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. You may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm just can't let go of on your own. I pray that you just put your hands out in a surrendering position if you're comfortable. We pray the name of Jesus over this group, Father. cry 
Father, we just declare this morning that we cannot get away from your love. And that is a good thing. Whether we're in our most or in our least, whether we feel lost or found, Lord, we cannot escape your love. And so we come here this morning, Lord, with empty hands. And you pour out that love over us. And those same empty hands can be lifted up to praise you, Lord. And that's what we do this morning. We praise you for your goodness and your love. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, you can be seated this morning. And this morning we have the opportunity to come before the Lord's table and celebrate communion together. And so if you're here in this room, uh, you'll find a little cup 
uh, in the, the bottom of the seat in front of you or, or under your seat. If you are at home watching online, uh, feel free to hit pause. Uh, I think you can hit pause and go grab some bread and juice and we'd love for you to participate as well. And one of the things that I love to do when I look at a passage in scripture is I try to visualize that. And if I had time this morning, I would bring up uh, 12 people to represent the disciples who were in the upper room with Jesus when they experienced this last supper. Uh, because that's the perspective that I wanna look at this moment through uh, this morning. Uh, because for me, when it, whenever I, I think of communion or I look at this packet, passage, it feels like a one-time moment for me. This is the Last Supper. This, this was kind of this special meal, this one-time thing. But for the disciples, this wasn't a one-time thing. That was a very special moment. But for them, this was the Passover meal that they were celebrating. And so every year they would do this. They would celebrate Passover. And uh, Passover was something, it was a memorial to what happened to the Israelites when they were rescued from Egypt. And so this had deep meaning for them. And I think most of you know the story of when the Israelites were rescued from Pharaoh in Egypt and God had his messenger Moses go before Pharaoh and ask that his people would be let go. But Pharaoh's heart was hardened. And it actually took a series of plagues. God had to bring a series of plagues to finally convince Pharaoh. And each plague was more severe than the last plague. And it kind of culminated with the most serious plague where God had sent the angel of death to go over all of the homes in Egypt. And for every home, the angel of death would kill the oldest son. It took this to change Pharaoh's heart. But for the Israelites, he provided a way to rescue them from this. And so he asked them to prepare a meal, the Passover meal. And he asked, he gave them the instructions to find a perfect lamb, a lamb without any blemish, without any sickness or disease, and to take that lamb, to kill it, prepare a meal, and to eat its flesh, the meat, and to take the blood and wipe it over your doors. And when the angel of death passes over, it will see a sacrifice was made and your son will be spared. Your family will be spared. And so it's this context that the disciples are celebrating this meal together with Jesus when Jesus takes the bread and he says, this is me, this is my body. And the other instructions they were given is to, uh, as part of the Passover meal was to make unleavened bread, bread without yeast. And in scripture, leaven symbolizes sin. So this is essentially sinless bread. And Jesus says, this is me, this is my body and it's for you. And he gives him the cup and says, this is my blood and it's for you. And so suddenly something that has this deep meaning for them where God rescues them, Jesus says, I, shows them, I am the lamb. I am that spotless lamb, willing to have my body broken and my blood shed for you. Now, I'm not sure if they understood, I don't think they could have understood the full meaning of that until days later when they see the resurrected Jesus. And for them, I think in that moment, what lied ahead was probably something that felt really dark and really hopeless for them. Can you imagine the disciples seeing their savior, their Messiah nailed to a cross? And how confusing, how hopeless that felt as if a door was being shut for them. And what I wanna tell you this morning is maybe you're feeling like that. Maybe you feel as if things are hopeless. Maybe you feel like another door has been shut for you. But just maybe, 
God is in the middle of doing his best work. Maybe that's something that has to happen in order for God to show his best work for you, to carry out his plan for you. And so as we take the bread this morning and drink the cup, I wanna encourage you in the same way, just picture how the disciples felt with Jesus actually handing them the bread, actually passing them the cup. And I wanna encourage you if you're comfortable, do that same motion of that act of receiving the bread in the cup. Would you take the bread this morning? And so Jesus took the bread and he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Whenever you do this, remember me. And then Jesus took the cup and he said, this is the new covenant in my blood. Whenever you do this, remember me. And so Father, we thank you. We thank you for your son, the perfect spotless lamb, the lamb of God, who has been sent to rescue us. Lord, and just like the Israelites were rescued from slavery, we are no longer slaves to sin. And we no longer have to fear death because of your lamb, because of the price that Jesus paid for us. He has conquered death. We can be in right standing with you. And we thank you for that gift in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, we've got uh, a message in just a moment, but before we do that, I want to invite you to fill out uh, the connection card in front of you. You'll find this in the seat back pocket in front of you. And this is something that's helpful for us so you can keep us updated on how to pray for you. And uh, we can keep in touch with you about all the events going on. And you know what? If you fill that out this morning, would you just, we have a number of volunteers who help uh, sort of process all those cards, just draw a little smiley face or something on there uh, to let them know how much we appreciate them volunteering. Uh, and while you do that, we're going to have youth stay in the room this morning and kids are released for their classrooms. Thank you. Good morning, glad you're here. Some people would refer to the next thing I'm going to talk about as housekeeping, but it's actually far more significant than that. Uh, next Sunday, our church family will select uh, the person who will sit on our church council for a three-year term. And uh, the way that's done in lots of places and lots of times is whoever is the most popular or knows the most people just kind of gets in or who has the most friends that are willing to, to uh, connect with others. Um, if you were to ask me five reasons why I think our church has seen fruitful growth, one of those reasons would be the people that God has brought to the council table to help oversee our finances and our ministries. And so we always approach this not as a political maneuver or a popularity contest, but as a prayerful moment. And our goal is just to simply to take the two individuals whose uh, names are presented to us and to pray and then cast our ballot. So if you are a member and you are here next Sunday, you will have the opportunity to do that. The two people whose names are, are standing are Emmanuel Bradley and Alphonse Sasso. And so I would covet your prayers uh, for those individuals and that God will bring the right person to the right place at the right time for the right reasons, amen? Good. Um, I'm setting my timer. Somebody wants to know what that means. Sometimes nothing at all. Okay. Uh, we're in the 20th week, believe it or not, of going through the Gospel of Matthew. 
And today we're going to deal with one of the most terrifying passages in all of Scripture. This is the passage that keeps some people awake at night and makes them most afraid about their relationship with God. And so what I'm hoping today is to tackle this in a way that helps us understand it better, but even more importantly, understand God better in the process. So in Matthew chapter 12, it starts by saying, then they, being some people, brought Jesus, a demon-possessed man, who was blind and mute, and Jesus healed him so that he could both talk and see. And all the people were astonished and said, could this be the son of David? So we start out with this uh, reality is that Jesus takes the spiritual realm as seriously as he takes the physical realm. And this is odd to the modern mind because we really have come to believe that basically every effect has a scientific cause and that the evidence that something is real is our capacity to see it with our eyes, to touch it with our hands, that, that our senses are actually what reveal what is real. And there are things that are invisible to us, but that does not mean they are not real. Our tendency in spirituality is to move one way or the other on this. Some of us move more towards the physical, and so we'll focus on maybe physical appearance, we'll focus on physical actions, we'll focus on physical deeds. There are other people who may gravitate more to the spiritual, so they'll focus more on reflection, meditation, those kinds of things. And Jesus just simply refuses to choose sides on this. He thinks the physical is important. He brings healing. He thinks the spiritual is important. And he brings freedom. And this is a, a fascinating uh, passage. And I know that to the modern mind, this feels superstitious. Like, well, of course, in, in the ancient world, everything they didn't understand, they just laid the blame to some kind of invisible, uh, malevolent spirit that caused this. But Jesus is not being superstitious. There's no fear in him, nor does he inspire fear in others. What he's recognized is that there are symptoms that this man is experiencing for which there does not seem to be a genetic cause, an injury cause, or a human pathology cause. There's something else going on. He's unable to see and he's unable to speak. But there is no scientific reason for his condition. So Jesus knows that there could be a spiritual reason. And he discerns the cause. And what's fascinating, this is really interesting, because we do have other stories of Jesus exercising evil spirits. We see nothing of his methodology here. It's not recorded for us. Matthew just leaves it out. And the word he uses to describe what happens to the man is that he was healed. This is really interesting information. And so what he says is he was healed and he was able to both see and to speak. And the result is, is that people began to ask a question. And the question was, could this be the son of David, that's a messianic term. Could this be the person that had been foretold for hundreds and hundreds of years that would come and, and restore the kingdom of Israel to its glory, but also make things right in our world? And so the thing is, is that there can be a positive and a negative way to ask that question. So here's what I want you to see. We should pay attention to questions that cause faith to contend with doubt. We should pay attention to questions that cause our faith to contend with our doubts. And so could this be the son of David? That can be a positive question and a negative question. Could this be the son of David? Positive. Is it possible? Negative. Could this be the son of David? And the question is, which one are they doing? And the answer is, in a crowd of people, you're likely to get both. And Jesus isn't offended by the question. He sees that this is actually evidence of the beginning of the work of the Holy Spirit in their lives. That there are questions that begin to come to us. 
And it's so easy to assume that it's our intellect and our capacity and, and, and what we've read and who we've talked to that determines the kinds of questions that form in our mind. But Jesus also understood that sometimes the Holy Spirit is at work in a way that helps us form a question in our mind that if we take it seriously, it's amazing where it can lead us. So it goes on and it says, but when the Pharisees heard this, they said, it is only by Beelzebul, uh, you probably have heard the name Beelzebub, uh, the prince of demons that this fellow drives out demons. This is not what we would refer to as an encouraging word. Okay. Uh, why are they upset? A person has been healed and now they can see and they can speak and and the Pharisees are upset. Well, they were upset when we left them last week. And that had to do with the Sabbath. They accused Jesus of not properly honoring the Sabbath. And his response was three, three responses from Scripture. Have you not read? Have you not read? Have you not read? And now he's going to respond in quite a, a different way. But the point here is that the Pharisees were already offended. And here's what I want you to, to take away from this. The more we think we know, the more easily we're offended when someone doesn't agree with us. The more we think we know, the more easily offended we are when someone doesn't agree with us. They did not say they were opposed to exorcism. They did not say, that's not true, that doesn't exist, that doesn't work, that can't be. Their offense was with Jesus. And here's the challenge, is that when people are offended, you've probably noticed this in our world, right? In our world, someone can't just have a different point of view. They have to be demonized. It's very rare to hear people say anymore, well, I can see that point of view, but this is how I think. That's not the kinds of conversations that happen very much. And it reveals something. So going on, it says, Jesus knew their thoughts and said to them, every kingdom divided against itself will be ruined and every city or household divided against itself will not stand. If Satan drives out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then can his kingdom stand? And if I drive out demons by Beelzebul, by whom do your people drive them out? So then they will be your judges. But if it is by the Spirit of God that I drive out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Or again, how can anyone enter a strong man's house and carry off his possessions unless he first ties up the strong man and then he can plunder the house? In the previous interaction with the Pharisees, Jesus responds with, it is written, it is written, it is written. In this response, he uses common sense. How many are glad that God can, can use common sense to help make a point, right? You did not have to check your brains at the door when you came in this morning. It's a rational response. And he, he challenges the idea that just because you don't agree with me does not mean that what's happening here is actually inspired by the demonic. And what he says is, if this person has found freedom as a result of the work of the Spirit, then it's evidence that God's kingdom is breaking in around you. What's interesting here is that Jesus declares that if he's acting with the authority of the Holy Spirit, this is really interesting, with the authority of the Holy Spirit, that God's kingdom is breaking in. We saw, Matthew's really interesting in how he lays things out. In Matthew chapter 1, we see the work of the Spirit in conceiving the life of Christ. In chapter 3, we see the work of the Holy Spirit empowering Jesus not only to face temptation, but to do the work of ministry and fulfill his purpose in God's kingdom. In chapter 10, we actually see the work of the Holy Spirit giving people confidence when they are attacked to be able to defend the gospel, the good news. And here we see the work of the Spirit to bring freedom to someone who was bound. 
They were unable to see. They were unable to speak. Now, I actually, I, this could be offensive to some people, I actually believe that this story is a real story and a true story. I don't think that the purpose of stories in the Bible is to, to metaphorically examine them and say, well, it doesn't matter whether it really happened or not. What matters is whether we can see the truth behind it. I don't think we have to pick and choose there either. It's a real story, but there's also truth behind it. This story is selected for a reason. It's given to us on purpose because there was an individual who was unable to see and unable to speak. I wonder how many people there are in our world today that when it comes to seeing what might be possible or seeing a way out or seeing how things could ever work for them or seeing things in a way that is actually healthy, it feels as though they can't ever see it and it doesn't matter how much you talk to them, they can't ever see it. And there are some people who never seem to find their voice, they are unable to to ask for help, and they are unable to speak up for themselves or for someone else. They have a voice. They're just unable to use it. They have eyes, but they're unable to see with them. And what Jesus does is he comes in and he binds the strong man. He takes authority over the evil spirit. And the result is this person walks out and now he could see things he couldn't see before and say things he couldn't ever say before. Now, somebody said, well, you're just saying if I'm shy that I'm, I have a demon. No, I am not. There are lots of things in our world that are not caused by demons. They're just caused by us. Okay? And some people do have a shy personality. Let's just check. How many people have a shy personality? Yeah. And the rest of you, you didn't raise your hand. Do you know why? Because you're shy. This isn't about, is your personality shy? It's a kind of thing where you're trapped. I just can't see anything possible, positive. I can't see any way out. I can't see how this is gonna work. I can't see how this marriage is gonna survive. I can't see how my kids are going to succeed in life. I can't see anything. And in that darkness, it's amazing how terrifying things can become. And we lose our voice. I don't think it's any accident that the first thing that happens when we're born is that our voice is heard in the world because it matters. Your voice matters. And he says, if by the Spirit of God I'm bringing freedom, healing like this, then the kingdom of God is breaking in around you. And the kingdom is actually a social word. It's, it's not a, a political word the way we think of it. And, and what, this is what he's saying. I, I love this. He's saying, if that person is finding freedom, it's not just that person finding freedom. The Holy Spirit is breaking into the community. What does that say? And, and here's the challenge. Often we hear that and what we think is, well, the Holy Spirit is breaking into our faith community. Hallelujah. God is doing things here at Calvary. We're so grateful for that. This is how Jesus interprets that. Not just God is doing something for an individual, and God is not just doing something for a community of faith. God is doing something for the greater Rochester area. It's evidence that the Spirit of God is breaking in. And not just in Rochester, but in New York, and not just in New York, but across the United States, and not just across our country, but across every tribe, every kindred, every tongue, every nation, every continent, every people group. How many are glad God is at work in our world today, right now? That's what he's doing. So, how many have also noticed not every need is met? Lots of us have, have needs that we probably have prayed for for a while. Some of you may have discovered a new one since you've been here. And so Jesus does not see a tension between the present kingdom and the future kingdom. The present kingdom shows that needs are being met right now, and the future kingdom shows that for the needs not yet met, there is coming a day when all the needs will be satisfied by the King of kings and the Lord of lords. It gives us something to look forward to. Um, there's also a, a picture of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit here. If I, Jesus is the acting agent, am 
have authority from the Holy Spirit to bring freedom, then the kingdom of God has come among you. The Son is the acting agent, which, which brings us to this point. Kingdom people do not act on their own authority or with their own agenda. If, if we're just trying to have our own authority, if we just want to have our own preferences imposed on others, that's really not the kingdom of God. We're trying to build another kingdom. And some people are really good kingdom builders, like they can do that. But if that's our goal, then that's, that's not evidence of God's kingdom breaking in, that's evidence of us building a kingdom. And those kingdoms are temporary at best. And so, then Jesus says this, the strong man is a reference to this evil power, can be tied up, can be bound, obviously by someone who's stronger, right? And this is what he says. I, I'm, I'm really, I'm not sure quite how to, to think about this. But if the strong man is tied up, then his possessions can be carried off. I think a lot of times we think of, of demonic possession as though a spirit is is influenced by evil spirits to do horrible things. And Jesus gives us a nuance here that I don't think we're very familiar with. And he said, this power, which is not neutral, it actually intends harm, has possessions. He considers people his possession. And when he is tied up, those possessions can be taken out of that influence. It's a really interesting concept. We always think of, well, possession would be doing a bad thing. Maybe if we are being owned by, controlled by something else, we're unable to do good things. Uh, beginning in verse 30, whoever is not with me is against me. Here we go. <laughs> <laughs> this is the stuff that drives our culture right up a wall. If you are under 25 years old, this verse has already offended you. If you're over 25 years old, you're waiting to see if you should be offended. And whoever does not gather with me scatters. And so I tell you that every kind of sin and slander can be forgiven, but blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. This is the terrifying verse. Anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but anyone who speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven, either in this age or in the age to come. That sounds serious. Here's what I want us to think. Jesus actually said, every sin can be forgiven. And then he said, blaspheming the Holy Spirit cannot be forgiven. Is that a contradiction? And it sounds like a contradiction to us. But when something sounds like a contradiction, it may be an opportunity to see something in a new way. And that's what I'm gonna to try to do this morning. Both Matthew and Luke quote Jesus saying this phrase this way. Mark actually has Jesus saying something different in a different story. In Mark chapter nine, Jesus says, anyone who is not against us is for us. So did Jesus change his mind or his position? Like, has he finally ticked off with the Pharisees and he's changed his mind? And the answer is no. The context of Mark chapter nine is the disciples came to Jesus and they said, we saw a person and they were casting out demons and they were using your name, but they're not one of us, so we forbid him. And Jesus said, don't forbid him. Anyone who's not against us is for us. What's the difference? In this scenario, there is a person who's trying to do good things to help people find freedom. In this story, we have Pharisees who care less about people's freedom and more about their control. And so Jesus is speaking to two different situations, two different kinds of people groups. Jesus can discern the difference. So in Mark 9, whoever is not against me, Jesus is saying this, working for, they're working for the same things. And Mark, we want people to find freedom. 
There are people who will try to do a similar thing, but they can't work with somebody else because they don't think just like them. I don't know anybody who thinks just like me, including myself five years ago. That's just true. In what ways can we bring freedom? And this is what Jesus comes to. He says, these Pharisees are acting to limit people's freedom, to make them afraid to access the resource that brings freedom. Jesus wasn't saying almost sin, almost every sin can be forgiven. Every sin can be forgiven, which brings us to another problem, and that is forgiveness is scandalous. Forgiveness is scandalous. What do I mean by that? There are sins that you can think of right now that you are likely to think should not be forgiven. Just by reason of the incredible, incredible, horrible damage that was done, the pain that was caused, the innocent lives that were ruined, and we are actually offended with God. How could you forgive them for that? Because that feels like injustice to us. How could God forgive that? And we are offended. And Jesus sees things quite differently. Every kind of sin and slander can be forgiven. That is incredible news, and it's frustrating news at the same time. Jesus says this. He says that speaking against the Holy Spirit is not forgiven in this age or the age to come. So is this a contradiction? Let's just check. How many would, would be willing to go out on a limb and say it feels, it, at least at first appearance, it seems like a contradiction. Yeah? Okay. We still have shy people in the house. Glad to, glad to see that. Um, Jesus understands something that we forget. And that is, it's not just information that changes a person. It's the work of the Spirit. It's the work of the Spirit that draws us towards God. It's the work of the Spirit that opens our hearts and opens our minds. It's the work of the Spirit that helps us realize we need forgiveness. It's the work of the Spirit that helps us receive forgiveness. And this is a very different way to think about this. It's not so much, you know, if you, if you say a bad thing about the Holy Spirit, that's it, you're done. It's more like this. The single resource that helps you experience, first of all, your need for forgiveness and receive the grace of forgiveness is actually the work of the Holy Spirit. And if you cut yourself off from the work of the Holy Spirit, what access do you have to it? it it's it's kind of like this, right? So if, you, if there's medication that you take to keep you healthy, to manage some kind of disease state, if you stop taking that medication, you're not going to get better. In fact, you may get worse. That's not a judgment. You just stopped accessing the one thing that could help you. If you are hungry and you separate yourself from food, you will not be nourished. In fact, you do it long enough, you could actually starve. If you're thirsty and you separate yourself from water, you will not be hydrated. You will actually become dehydrated. That's not a judgment against you. It's just recognizing if I fail to access the thing that makes me healthy or, may, or nourishes me or hydrates me, that there are real consequences for that. And what he's saying is, is when you separate yourself from the work of the Holy Spirit, where do you think you're going to find forgiveness? Where are you going to find grace? 
Forgiveness and grace is not something we work up on our own merits, in our own strength, by our own intellect. That's not how it works at all. Forgiveness and grace are not things we achieve. They are gifts we receive from the Holy Spirit. We should always want whatever the work of the Holy Spirit is in our lives. If we cut ourselves off from the Holy Spirit, we're cutting ourselves off from the only resource that brings us to God, that convicts us of our sins, and that helps us know we are forgiven and that we actually belong to God. Now, our questions can be evidence of the Holy Spirit's work. I think a lot of times our, our tendency is to believe that I can prove the Holy Spirit is working in my life because I became convinced about something. Maybe the questions that are coming to your mind are evidence that the Holy Spirit is working. Could this be true? Could this be the Spirit of God? Could God be doing something in my life right now? That question could well be inspired by the Holy Spirit. I'm going to ask the worship team to come up. Jesus goes on and says, make a tree good and its fruit will be good. Make a tree bad, its fruit will be bad. For a tree is recognized by its fruit. You brood of vipers, how can you say, how can you say, uh, you who are evil say anything good, for the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. A good man brings good things out of the good stored up in him, and an evil man brings things out of the evil stored up in him. But I tell you, that everyone will have to give an account on the day of judgment for every word that they've spoken. By your words, you'll be acquitted. By your words, you'll be condemned. Jesus uses this concept a lot, that you can identify what a tree is by the fruit it produces, not the other way around. If you're experiencing hope and, and freedom and healing and growth and community, that's good fruit. That's good. If you're experiencing shame, life controlling behaviors, stagnation, isolation, it's not good. And it really doesn't matter how much of a moral argument we can make in our mind. It's not good. Jesus is on the cross because people have said things about him that were not true. And he's being crucified and he's being mocked and beaten. And in that moment, what is his response? And it's amazing. You can say anything against the son. Listen to his words. Father, forgive them. Any sin can be forgiven. That is the most astonishing news. They don't understand what they're doing. Forgive them. Jesus wasn't offended by what was said about him because Jesus was confident in who he was in relationship to his Father. So let's bow our heads this morning. Question, do you feel trapped? Do you not see a way out? Have you lost your voice to be able either to ask for help or to stand up and speak up for things that matter? And what Jesus wants you to know is that the healer is in the house today. And you don't have to stay in that condition any longer. He's come to give you your voice back. He's come to show you things that you cannot see on your own. It's a work of the Holy Spirit. And you might be sitting there and wondering, could this even possibly be true? Maybe that question itself is the beginning of the work of His Holy Spirit. And it will make all the difference, all the difference in your life and in the lives of anyone who has anything to do with you. So Father, for those who feel trapped, for those who feel blinded to what could be possible that is good in their lives, for those who are unable to speak up, 
Would you help them find the freedom today by bringing healing to their lives? In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand together. Father, would you help us today that in those moments when we feel trapped as though we're, we're controlled, unable to see or say the things that could make all the difference, will you bring your healing touch, set us free unto the life you've called us to in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. You may be seated this morning. Um, Sometimes we have trouble imagining how the money and the resources that we release can make a difference in someone else's life. And sometimes we don't realize what a blessing that is to people. A blessing is not always a word that we say, sometimes it's an action that we take. And so we have the opportunity to see the potential and to be a blessing. And that's why we practice generosity. It's not a one-time event. It's an ongoing habit to help us be able to be a resource into others' lives until everyone knows the kingdom has broken in around them. So Father, I ask that your blessing would be on what we are about to let go of and that you would use it for your glory, but also for others' benefits. In Jesus' name, amen. If you are on campus, uh, those of you uh, who are here, we ask if you're giving a physical gift to place it in an envelope, it just adds another layer of security. And uh, most people actually give electronically. If you go to rcalvary.org, r for Rochester, calvary.org forward slash give, there'll be a, a, a convenient and safe way for you to give. And for those of you watching online, that really is the best option for you. God bless. All right, I've got three quick announcements for you this morning. Uh, next Sunday is our Vision Sunday, and uh, it's a chance for us to share and celebrate all of the goodness that God has done in and through our church over this past year, and to kind of look forward to our future as a church family together. And I will tell you that that is a Sunday where you will experience transparency and vision. And for me, it's, it's a can't miss Sunday. Um, and when you come to that, you will get one of these uh, annual business reports. And this is not boring. This is full of exciting numbers and stories and uh, 
It is so cool to read through this. So I would love for you to see that. Uh, secondly, coming up March 9th, I believe, a, a Thursday, uh, is a blood drive. And it's not just any blood drive. <laughs> it's a blood drive where we get to celebrate a special girl, Lydia, who uh, is sweet and spunky, and I have very fond memories of her in kids ministry and sacred girls. And what I will tell you is that um, when her leukemia relapsed, she had a two month period where I think she had about 21 blood transfusions. And the blood re she received was a gift. And that is something that you can give to someone else who needs that. And so it's not just a chance to give blood, it's also a chance to honor Lydia. And I would love for you to come out and just celebrate her life. And, uh, and then finally, we've got pretzels with the pastors this morning, uh, right after this service down in the lower level. And if you are newer here, if you've come in the last two or three months, we invite you to come down and be a part of that. Um, even if you haven't signed up, there's still room for you. It's a chance for you to connect with our ministry team. And it's a chance for you to hear about all the ways you can get connected and plugged in. And we'd love for you to be a part of that. Would you stand with me this morning? And I'd like to invite our prayer team forward. Um, Father, I, I love some of the words in that last song we, we closed with. Um, and Lord, would you just allow us to, to let your scarred hands that were scarred out of love shape our hearts. And Lord, as we leave this place, would we be a light to others? We pray that in Jesus' name, amen. Have a great Sunday.